Chapter 5 of Astounding Stories 8, August 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 8, August 1930, by Arthur J. Burks. Chapter 5 The Second Satellite by Edmund Hamilton, Part 2. While they talked, the sunlight, apparently sourceless, that came through the heavily barred windows of the room faded rapidly, and dusk settled over the great amphibian city beneath the giant dome, kept from total darkness by a silvery pervading light that Norman reflected must be the light from Earth's great sphere. With the dusk's coming, the activities in the Frog City lessened greatly. With dusk, too, frog guards entered the room bearing long metal troughs filled with a red jelly-like substance that they placed on racks along the wall. As the guards withdrew, the men in the room rushed toward the troughs, elbowing each other aside and striking each other to scoop up and eat as much of the red jelly as possible. It was for all the world like the feeding of farm animals, and Hackett and Norman so sickened at the sight that they had no heart to try the food. Sarja, though, had no such scruples and seemed to make a hearty meal at one of the troughs. After the meal, the green men sought the bunks and soon were stretched in sonorous slumber. It was, Norman reflected, exactly the existence of domesticated animals, to eat and sleep and give food to their masters. A deeper horror of the frogmen shook him, and a deeper determination to escape them. He waited until all in the room were sleeping before beckoning to Sarja and Hackett. Quiet now, he whispered to them. If these others wake, they'll make such a clamor we won't have a chance in the world. Ready, Sarja? The green man nodded. Yes, though I still think such a thing's impossible. Probably is, Norman admitted but it's the one chance we've got, the immensely greater strength of our earth muscle that the frogmen must have forgotten when they put us in here. They moved silently to the room's great barred door, outside which a frog guard paced. They waited until he had passed the door and on down the hall, then Norman and Hackett and Sarja grasped together one of the door's vertical bars. It was an inch and a half in thickness, of solid metal and it seemed ridiculous that any men could bend it by the sheer strength of their muscles. Norman, though, was relying on the fact that on the second satellite, with its far lesser gravitational influence, their earth muscles gave them enormous strength. He grasped the bar, Hackett and Sarja gripping it below him, and then at a whispered word they pulled with all their force. The bar resisted, and again, with sweat starting on their foreheads, they pulled. It gave a little. They shrank back from it as the guard returned, moving past. Then, grasping the bar again, they bent all their force once more upon it. Each effort saw it bending more, the opening in the door's bars widening. They gave a final great wrench, and the bent bar squealed a little. They shrank back, appalled, but the guard had not heard or noticed. He moved past it on his return along the hall, and no sooner was past it than Norman squeezed through the opening and leaped silently for the great frogman's back. It went down with a wild flurry of waving webbed paws and croaking cries, stilled almost instantly by Norman's terrific blows. There was silence then as Hackett and Sarja squeezed out after him the momentary clamor of the battle having aroused no one. The three leaped together toward the stairs. In two great floating leaps they were on the floor above, Hackett and Norman dragging Sarja between them. They were not seen, were sailing in giant steps up another stair, hopes rising high. The last stair, the roof opening above, and then from beneath a great croaking cry swelled instantly into a chorus of alarmed shouts. They found the door! The guard! panted Hackett. They were bursting out onto the roof. Frog guards were on it, who came in a hopping rush toward them, force pistols raised. 
but a giant leap took Hackett among them to amaze them for a moment with great flailing blows. Sarja had leaped for the nearest flying boat resting on the roof and was calling in a frantic voice to Norman and Hackett. Norman was turning toward Hackett, the center of a wild combat, but the latter emerged from it for a brief second to motion him frantically back. "'No use, Norman! Get away! Get away!' he cried hoarsely, frenziedly. "'Hackett, for God's sake!' Norman half leaped to the other, but an arm caught him, pulled him desperately onto the boat's surface. It was Sarja, the long craft flying over the roof beneath his control. "'They come!' he panted. "'Too late now!' Frogmen were pouring up onto the roof from below. Sarja sent the craft rocketing upward as Hackett gestured them away for a last frantic time before going down beneath the frogmen's onslaught. The roof and the combat on it dropped back and beneath them like a stone as their craft rippled across the silvery dusk over the mighty frog city. They were shooting toward the city's center, toward the green pool that was the entrance to the water tunnel, while behind and beneath an increasing clamor of alarms spread swiftly. Norman raged futilely. Hackett! Hackett! We can't leave him! Too late, Sarja cried. We cannot help him but only be captured again. We escape now and come back. Come back! The truth of it pierced Norman's brain even in the wild moment. Hackett had fought and held back the frog guards only that they might escape. He shouted suddenly. Sarja! The water tunnel! A half-dozen boats with frog guards on them were rising round it in answer to the alarm. They force gun, cried the green man, beside you. Norman whirled, glimpsed the long tube on its swivel beside him, trained it on the boats rising ahead as they rocketed nearer. He fumbled frantically at a catch on the gun's rear, then felt a stream of shells flicking out of it. Two of the boats ahead vanished as the shells released their annihilating force, Another sagged and fell. From the remaining three invisible force shells flicked around them, but in an instant Sarja had whirled the boat through them and down into the water tunnel. Norman clung desperately to his seat as the boat flashed down through the waters, and then, as Sarja sent it flying out through the great tunnel's waters, glimpsed, close behind, the beams of the three Rala boats as they pursued them through the tunnel, overtaking them. Could the force shells be fired underwater? Norman did not know, but desperately he swung the force gun back as they rushed through the waters and pressed the catch. An instant later, beams and boats behind them in the tunnel vanished. His lungs were afire. It seemed that he must open them to the strangling water. The boat was ripping the waters at such tremendous speed that he felt himself being torn from his hold on it. Pain seemed poured like molten metal through his chest. He could hold out no longer. And then the boat stabbed up from the waters into clear air. Norman panted, sobbed. Behind them rose the colossal metal dome of the Frog City, gleaming dully in the silvery light that flooded the far-stretching seas. That light poured down from a stupendous silver crescent in the night skies. Norman saw dully the dark outlines on it before he remembered. Earth! He laughed a little hysterically. Sarja was driving the flying boat out over the sea and away from the frog city at enormous speed. At last he glanced back. Far behind them lay the great dome, and up around it gleaming lights were pouring, lights of pursuing Rala boats. We escape, Sarja cried the city of the Ralas, from which none ever before escaped. Remembrance smote Norman. Hackett, held off those frogmen so we could get away. We'll come back for him, by God. We come back, said Sarja. We come back with all the green men of this world to the Ralas city, yes. I know what Phallus has planned. Can you find your way to him, to your city? Norman asked. Sarja nodded, looking upward. Before the next sun has come and gone, we can reach it. 
The boat flew onward, and the great dome and the searching lights around it dropped beneath the horizon. Norman felt the warm wind drying his drenched garments as they rushed onward. Crouched on the boat, he gazed up toward the silver crescent of earth sinking toward the horizon ahead. That meant, he told himself, that the satellite turned slowly on its axis as it whirled around Earth. It came to him that its night and day periods must be highly irregular. When the sun climbed from the waters behind them, they were flying still over a boundless waste of waters, but soon they sighted on the horizon ahead the thin green line of land. Sarja slowed as they reached it, took his bearings, and sent the craft flying onward. They passed over a green coastal plain and then over low hills joined in long chains and mantled by dense and mighty jungles, towering green growths of unfamiliar appearance to Norman. He thought he glimpsed, more than once, huge beast-like forms moving in them. He did see twice in the jungles great clearings where were fair-sized cities of bright green buildings, a metal tower rising from each but when he pointed to them Sarja shook his head. At last, as they passed over another range of hills and came into sight of a third green city with its looming tower, the other pointed, his face alight. "'My city,' he said. "'Foul us there!' "'Fellows!' Norman's heart beat faster. They shot closer and lower, and he saw that the buildings were obviously green to lend them a certain protective coloration similar to that of the green jungles around them. The tower with its surmounting cage puzzled him, though, but before he could ask Sarja concerning it, his answer came in a different way. A long metal tube poked slowly out of the cage on the tower's top and sent a hail of force shells flicking around them. "'They're firing on us!' Norman cried. This can't be your city. They see our black boat, Sarja exclaimed. They think we are all raiders, and unless we let them know, they'll shoot us out of the air. Stand up. Wave to them. Both Norman and Sarja sprang to their feet and waved wildly to those in the tower cage, their flying boat drifting slowly forward. Instantly the four shells ceased to hail toward them, and as they moved nearer, a siren-like signal broke from the cage. At once scores of flying boats like their own, but glittering metal instead of black, shot up from the city where they had lain until now, and surrounded them. As Sarja called in his own tongue to them, the green men on the surrounding boats broke into resounding cries. They shot down toward the city, Norman gazing tensely. Great crowds of green men in their dark tunics had swarmed out into its streets with the passing of the alarm, and their craft and the others came to rest in an open square that was the juncture of several streets. The green men that crowded excitedly about Norman and Sarja gave way to a half-dozen hurrying into the square from the greatest of the buildings facing on it. All but one were green men like the others. But that one, the laughing-eyed, tanned face, the worn brown clothing, the curious huge steps with which he came, Norman's heart leapt. Fellows! Great God, Norman! The other's face was thunderstruck. Norman, how by all that's holy did you get here? Norman, mind and body strained to the breaking point, was incoherent. We guessed how you'd gone. The second satellite, fellows, Hackett and I came after you, taken to that frog city. As Norman choked the tail, Fellow's face was a study, and when it was finished he swallowed and gripped Norman's hand vice-like. And you and Hackett figured it out and came after me? Took that risk? Crazy, both of you, crazy. Fellows, Hackett's still there if he's alive, in the Rala city. Fellow's voice was grim, quick. We'll have him out, Norman, if he still lives. And living or dead, the Rallas will pay soon for this and all they've done upon this world in ages. Their time nears, yes. He led Norman, excited throngs of the green men about them, into the great building from which he'd emerged. 
There were big rooms inside, workshops and laboratories that Norman but vaguely glimpsed in passing. The room to which the other led him was one with a long metal couch. Norman stretched protestingly upon it at the other's bidding, drifted off almost at once into sleep. He woke to find the sunlight that had filled the room gone and replaced by the silvery earthlight. From the window he saw that the silver-lit city outside now held tremendous activity, immense hordes of green men surging through it with masses of weapons and equipment, flying boats pouring down out of the night from all directions. He turned as the door of his room clicked open behind him. It was his old friend Fellows. I thought you'd be awake by now, Norman. Feeling fit? As though I'd slept a week, Norman said, and the other laughed his old carefree laugh. You almost have at that. Two days and nights you've slept, but it all adds up to hardly more than a dozen hours. This world, Norman's voice held all his incredulity. To think that we should be on it, a second satellite of Earth's, it seems almost beyond belief. Sometimes it seems so to me, too, Fellows said thoughtfully. But it's not a bad world, not the human part of it at least. When this satellite's atmosphere caught me and pitchforked me down among these green men, smashing the plane and almost myself, they took care of me. You say three others vanished as I did? I never heard of them here. They must have crashed into the sea or jungles. Of course I'd have got back to Earth on one of these flying boats if I'd been able, but their molecular power won't take them far from this world's surface, so I couldn't. As it was, the green men cared for me, and when I found how those frogmen have dominated this world for ages, how that city of the Rallas has spread endless terror among the humans here, I resolved to smash those monsters whatever I did. I taught some of the green men like Sarja my own speech, later learning theirs, and in the weeks I've been here, I've been working out a way to smash the Rallas. You know that amphibian city is almost impregnable, because humans can hardly live long enough under the water to get into it, let alone fight underwater as the frogmen can. To meet them on even terms the green men needed diving helmets with an oxygen supply. They'd never heard of such an idea, too afraid of the sea ever to experiment in it, but I convinced them and they've made enough helmets for all their forces. In them they can meet the Rallas underwater on equal terms. And there's a chance we can destroy that whole Ralla city with their help. It's built on a giant pedestal of rock rising from the sea's floor, as you saw, and I've had some of the green men make huge force shells, or force bombs, that ought to be powerful enough to split that pedestal beneath the city. If we can get a chance to place those bombs, it may smash the frogmen forever on this world. But one thing is sure, we're going to get Hackett out if he still lives. Then you're going to attack the Rala city now, Norman cried. Fellows nodded grimly. While you have slept, all the forces of the green men on this world have been gathering. Your coming has only precipitated our plans, Norman. The whole soul of the green races has been set upon this attack for weeks. Norman, half bewildered at the swiftness with which events rushed upon him, found himself striding with fellows in great steps out through the building into the great square. It was shadowed now by mass on mass of flying boats, crowded with green men, that hung over it and over the streets. One boat, Sarja at its controls, waited on the ground, and as they entered and buckled themselves into the seats, the craft drove up to hang with the others. A shattering cheer greeted them. Norman saw that in the silvery light of Earth's great crescent there stretched over the city and surrounding jungle now a veritable plain of flying boats. On each were green men, and each bristled with force guns, and had as many great goggled helmets fastened to it as had occupants. 
he glimpsed larger boats loaded with huge metal cylinders, the force bombs Fellows had mentioned. Fellows rose and spoke briefly in a clear voice to the assembled green men on their craft, and another great shout roared from them, and from these who watched in the city below. Then, as he spoke a word, Sarja sent their craft flying out over the city, and the great mass of boats, fully a thousand in number, were hurtling in a compact column after them. Fellows leaned to Norman as the great column of purring craft shot on over the silver-lit jungles. We'll make straight for the Rala city and try setting into it before they understand what's happening. Won't they have guards out? Probably, but we can beat them back into the city before their whole forces can come out on us. That's the only way in which we can get inside and reach Hackett. And while we're attacking, the force bombs can be placed, though I don't rely too much on them. If the attack only succeeds in getting us inside, Norman said, grim-lipped, we'll have a chance. It's on the knees of the gods. These green men are doing an unprecedented thing in attacking the Rallas, the masters of this world, remember? But they've got ages of oppression to avenge. They'll fight. The fleet flew on, hills and rivers a silver-lit panorama unreeling beneath them. Earth's crescent sank behind them, and by the time they flashed out over the great freshwater sea, the sun was rising like a flaming eye from behind it. Land sank from sight behind and the green men were silent, tense, as they saw stretching beneath only the gray waters that for ages had been the base of the dread frogmen. But still the fleet's column raced on. At last the column slowed. Far ahead, the merest bulge broke the level line where sky and waters met. The amphibian city of the Rallas. At Fellow's order, the flying boats sank downward until they moved just above the waters. Another order made the green hosts don the grotesque helmets. Norman found that while cumbersome, their oxygen supply was unfailing. They shot on again at highest speed, but as the gigantic black dome of the Frog City grew in their vision, there darted up from around it suddenly a far-flung swarm of black spots. Rala boats! The muffled exclamation was Fellows. There needed now no order on his part, though. Like hawks, leaping for prey, the fleet of the green men sprang through the air. Norman, clutching the force gun between his knees, had time only to see that the Rala craft were a few hundred in number, and that, contemptuous of the greater odds that favored these humans they had so long oppressed, they were flying straight to meet them. Then the two fleets met, and were spinning side by side above the waters. Norman saw the thing only as a wild whirl of Rala boats toward and beside them, great green frogmen crowding the craft, their force guns hailing shells. Automatically, with the old air-fighting instinct, his fingers had pressed the catch of the gun between his knees, and as its shells flicked toward the rushing boats he saw areas of nothingness opening suddenly in their mass, shells striking and exploding in annihilating invisibility there and in their own fleet. The two fleets mingled and merged momentarily, the battle becoming a thing of madness, a huge whirl of black and glittering flying boats together, striking shells exploding nothingness about them. The Rallas were fighting like demons. The merged, terrific combat lasted but moments, could last but moments. Norman, his gun's magazine empty, seemed to see the mass of struggling ships splittering, diverging then saw that the black craft were dropping, plummeting downward toward the waves. The Rallas, stunned by that minute of terrific combat, were fleeing. Muffled cries and cheers came from about him as the glittering flying boats of the green men shot after them. They crashed down into the waters and curved deeply into their green depths toward the gigantic dome.
Ahead the Rala boats were in flight toward their city, and now their pursuers were like sharks striking after them. There in the depths the force guns of black and glittering boats alike were spitting, and giant waves and underwater convulsions rocked pursued and pursuers as the exploding shells annihilated boats and water about them. The tunnel! Its round opening yawned into the looming wall ahead, and Norman saw the Rala craft, reduced to scores in number, hurtling into it to rouse all the forces of the great amphibian city. Their own boats were flashing into the opening after them. He glimpsed, as he glanced back for a moment, the larger craft with the great force bombs veering aside behind them. It was nightmare in the water tunnel. Flashing beams of the craft ahead and waters that rocked and smashed around them as in flight the Rallas still rained back force shells toward them in a chaos of action. Once the frogmen turned to hold them back in the tunnel, but by sheer weight the rushing ships of the green men crashed them onward. Boats were going into nothingness all around them. A part of Norman's brain wondered calmly why they survived, even while another part kept his gun again working, with refilled magazine. Fellows and Sarja were grotesque shapes beside him. Abruptly the tunnel curved upward, and as they flashed up after the remaining Rala craft, their boats ripped up into clear air. They were beneath the giant dome. The frogmen chased inward spread out in all directions over their mighty swarming city, and across it a terrific clamor of alarm ran instantly as the green men emerged after them. Norman saw flying boats beginning to rise across all the city and realized that moments would see all the immense force of the Rallas, the thousands of craft they could muster, pouring upon them. He pointed out over the city to a block-like building and shouted madly through his helmet to Fellows and Sarja, Hack it! But already Sarja had sent their craft whirling across the city toward the structure, half their fleet behind it, with parts still emerging from the water tunnel. Rala boats rose before them, but nothing could stop them now, their force shells raining ahead to clear a path for their meteor flight. They shot down toward the block structure, and Norman, half crazed by now, saw that to descend and enter was suicide in the face of the frog forces rising now all over the city. He cried to fellows, and with two of the guns, as they swooped lower, they sprayed force shells along the building's side. The shells struck and whiffed away the whole side, exposing the level on the building's interior. Out from it rushed swarms of crazed green men, sweeping aside the frogmen guards, while far over the city the invading craft were loosing shells on the block-like buildings that held the prisoners, tens of thousands of them swarming forth. In the throng below as they raced madly forth Norman saw one and shouted wildly. The one brown-garbed figure looked up, saw their boat swooping lower, and leaped for it, in a tremendous forty-foot spring that brought his fingers to its edge. Norman pulled him frenziedly up. Norman, he babbled, in God's name, Fellows! That helmet, Hackett, Fellows flung at him. My God, look at those prisoners, Norman! The countless thousands of green men released from the buildings whose walls had vanished under the shells of the invaders had poured forth to make the amphibian city a chaos of madness. Oblivious to all else, they were throwing themselves upon the city's crowding frogmen in a battle whose ferocity was beyond belief, disregarding all else in this supreme chance to wreak vengeance on the monstrous beings who had fed upon their blood. In the incredible insanity of that raging fury the craft of the green men hanging over the city were all but forgotten. Suddenly the city and the mighty dome over it quivered violently, and then again. There came from beneath a dull, vast, grinding roar. The great force bombs, fellows screamed. They've set them off. The city's sinking. Out of here for the love of God. 
The boat whirled beneath Sarge's hands toward the pool of the water tunnel, all their fleet rushing with them. The grinding roar was louder, terrible. Dome and city were shaking violently now. But in the insensate fury of their struggle, the frogmen and their released prisoners were hardly aware of it. The whole great dome seemed sinking upon them and the city falling beneath it as Sarge's craft ripped down into the tunnel's waters and then out, at awful speed, as the great tunnel's walls swayed and sank around them. They shot out into the green depths from it to hear a dull, colossal crashing through the waters from behind as the great pedestal of rock on which the city had stood, shattered by the huge force bombs, collapsed. And as their boats flashed up into the open air, they saw that the huge dome of the city of the Rallas was gone. Beneath them was only a titanic whirlpool of foaming waters in which only the curved top of the settling dome was visible for a moment as it sank slowly and ponderously downward with a roar as of the roar of falling worlds. Buckling, collapsing, sinking. It vanished into the foam-wild sea with all the frogmen who for ages had ruled the second satellite, and with all those prisoners who had at the last dragged them down with them to death. Ripping off their helmets, with all the green men shouting crazily about them, Norman and Fellows and Hackett stared down at the colossal maelstrom in the waters that was the tomb of the masters of a world. Then the depression's sides collapsed, the waters rushing together, and beneath them was but troubled, tossing sea. Earth's great gray ball was overhead again, and the sun was sinking again to the horizon when the three soared upward in the long, gleaming plain, its motor roaring. Norman, with Hackett and Fellows crowding the narrow cabin beside him, waved with them through its windows for all around them were rising the flying boats of the green men. They were waving wildly, shouting their farewells, Sarge's tall figure erect at the prow of one. Insistent they had been that the three should stay, the three through whom the monstrous age-old tyranny of the frogmen had been lifted, but earth sickness was on them, and they had flown to where the plain lay still unharmed among the reeds, a hundred willing hands dragging it forth for the takeoff. The plane soared higher, motor thundering, and they saw the flying boats sinking back from around them. They caught the wave of Sarge's hand still from the highest, and then that too was gone. Upward they flew toward the great gray sphere, their eyes on the dark outlines of its continents and on one continent. Higher, higher, Green land and gray sea receding beneath them, Hackett and Fellows intent and eager as Norman kept the plane rising. The satellite lay, a greenish globe, under them. And as they went higher still, a rushing sound came louder to their ears. The edge of the satellite's atmosphere? Fellows asked, as Norman nodded. We're almost to it. Here we go. As he shot the plane higher, great forces smote it, gray earth and green satellite and yellow sun gyrating round it as it reeled and plunged. Then suddenly it was falling steadily, gray earth and its dark continent now beneath, while with a dwindling rushing roar its second satellite whirled away above them, passing and vanishing. Passing as though, to Norman it seemed, all their strange sojourn on it were passing. The frogmen and their mighty city, Sarja and their mad flight, the green men and the last terrific battle, all whirling away, whirling away. End of Chapter 5 Recording by Zach Brewstergeis, Greenbelt, Maryland